and um, I just wanted to just start and then people will probably be trickling in. Hi everybody, good evening. Uh, my name is Patty. I'm the disembodied voice that you're hearing. I'm an adult reference librarian at the San Leandro Public Library. I'm coming at you with Armando and we are uh, helping you guys out with a pros and cons voter education presentation presented by our very special guests, the League of Women Voters of the Eden area. They represent the communities of Ashland, Castro Valley, Cherryland, Fairview, Hayward, Hillcrest Knoll, San Leandro, and San Lorenzo. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organiza organization. They prioritize voter participation and they influence government through public policy and advocacy. So right now, voter education is an important and integral part to a functioning democracy, right? Part of it is offering the voting population the opportunity to consider accurate and balanced, even viewpoints. We are so happy to have our special guests today. They are Helen and Linda. And we have Helen, Linda Slater, as she has been a member of the League of Women Voters of the Eden area since 2000. She has been serving in various roles for the organization over the years. The League's mission to encourage informed and active participation in government has always inspired her. She retired in 2016, resides in San Leandro, and enjoys reading, yay, cooking, friends, family, and traveling. We also have Helen Rueda, and she's a lifelong resident of Castro Valley. She attended public schools, and her children attended the same elementary, middle, and high school that she did growing up. Helen has been a volunteer with the League of Women Voters for one year, and this is the first election year that she's been an active participant in voter education. She is thrilled to be part of our pros and cons presentation this evening, and she has embraced the task as a learning opportunity to better educate herself and to become a more informed voter. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us. I will let you know that this is a one and a half to two hour session. This is a meaty uh, uh, presentation on all of the ballot measures that we have in the state of California. If you cannot make the entirety of the session, don't worry at all, we will be taping the session and it's going to be available on our YouTube station and via all of our social media platforms, okay? So not to worry if it's feeling a little overwhelming right now, like everything this year, but um, not to worry, we'll have that on tape. Uh, before I let Helen and Linda take hold of the reins, I will let you know that everybody is going to be muted except for our presenters, Helen and Linda, okay? Uh, but you can definitely use our chat box located at the bottom of the screen to answer questions. All right, thank you so much, Helen and Linda. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Linda Slater and um, I'm going to open it up. I'm so glad that you have uh, decided to come to listen to this presentation on the pros and cons of the 12 ballot measures that are going to be in your ballot for November 3rd. We're presenting this pros and cons, which has been developed primarily through the League of Women Voters of California's Education Fund, a 501c3 nonpartisan organization which encourages informed and active participation in government and works to increase understanding of major policy issues. Um, the League of Women Voters California Education Fund does not support or oppose candidates to or political parties or ballot measures. It is our job to inform you. It is a nonpartisan explanation of state propositions with supporting and opposing arguments. Uh, the arguments come from many sources and are not limited to those presented in the official voter information guide that's provided by the California Secretary of State. And the League does not judge the merits of the arguments or guarantee their validity. 
So one of the things that we do try to do through these presentations is realize that supporters and opponents of the various propositions uh, might give you just one side to the, our, uh, the discussion about the uh, merits of the proposition and could be misleading. Next slide, please. And they, because they won it when you vote. So what's the best way to evaluate uh, a ballot proposition? Well, which side are you agreeing with right off the bat? When you first read it, think about whether, whether you agree with it or not. What measures do, does it want to uh, accomplish? Do you agree with those goals? You can also look at who's really behind it. Follow the money. Uh, the League of Women Voters Voters Edge Guide does give uh, information about the uh, who's supporting it, and we will be presenting that tonight as well. Who's supporting it, which organizations, which individuals, and how much money are they putting behind this particular ballot measure? And you also want to look if this is a single topic or a more complicated topic, because a few of these propositions have multiple goals. And so you want to make sure that you understand um, the, the full concept of the proposition to make an informed judgment about it. Go ahead. So um, we're going to cover 12 states um, and probably, are we going to cover the one county one as well? Probably not. Yeah, I think probably not. Probably not tonight. I don't think we were prepared for that. So apologize for that. But uh, we're going to start with the first proposition, which is there's Proposition 14 through 25. So we're going to go ahead and go through all of those. Um, this one last note of, that the League indicates is that this is not a test. Voting is um, something that you want to do with confidence and with um, a sure knowledge of what you're voting on. So if you are unsure or not familiar with a particular candidate or a particular ballot proposition, you can always leave it blank. There is no right or wrong to that. The, the major point that we want to uh, get across is that um, we'd like you to be informed. We'd like you to vote because it is um, your vote, your voice. So we'll go ahead and get started with Proposition 14 and Helen's going to take over from here. Okay, Proposition 14 is known as uh, Bonds for Stem Cell Research. The question is, should California sell 5.5 billion in new bonds to continue funding grants for research and development of stem cell treatment? So the situation is the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine CIRM was created and funded by $3 billion in bond funding in 2004. CIRM funds research for disease treatment using stem cells and clinical trials. As of June 2020, the CIRM has used nearly all of its bond funding and needs additional dollars to continue its operation. So the proposal is, do we allow the state to sell 5.5 billion in new bonds over 11 years to continue CIRM funding. It sets limits on the amount of funding that can be used for administration and targets funding to research and treatment of certain diseases. It also makes changes in the CIRM governance management intended to expand patient access to stem cells. So the fiscal effects, the net fiscal impact is unknown. Total costs are estimated at 7.8 billion over 30 years. That's 5.5 billion in principal and 2.3 billion interest to repay the bondholders. This would average about 260 million per year. And the state would also receive revenue from future CIRM inventions, but that revenue is not known. So the, um, excuse me, so repaying a 5.5 for bonds plus interest from the general fund, as I said, will cost about 260 a year. So that's the budget effect. So we said earlier, we're going to follow the money. Who is uh, supporting 
uh, for and who is against. So you can see here Robert N. Klein, Second Corporation, Juvenile Beat Diabetes Research, Open Philanthropy is an action fund, um, University of California Regents, and 95 organizations which are mainly medical in nature. Those against are the Bakersfield.com News and the Harvest, uh, Howard Jarvis Taxpayers. Now those who are for it say that stem cell funding in California has led to treatment and cures for many diseases and over 2,900 medical discoveries. It will increase patients' access, affordable treatments, and provide fin financial assistance. Supporters is supported by over 70 patient advocate organizations. And supporters also say that it will contribute to the rebound of California's economy and he's created 10.7 billion in economic stimulus to date. Opponents say that California cannot afford the 7.3 billion, particularly in the midst of an economic crisis. Repayments of the bonds will increase taxes. They're stating that previous funds have not yielded the promised results for treatment or economic benefits. They're stating private investors and companies have made great strides in stem cell research and cures. Independent analysts and news outlets have questioned the management integrity and transparency of CIRM. So what your yes vote would mean is that yes, you want to pay an additional bonds to continue this California stem cell research. A no vote would say no more California bond money for stem cell research. So we've agreed to open up um, to questions at the end of each proposition and uh, we'll see how that progresses, progresses through the night. <laughs> so are there any questions on this? And I believe, uh, Patty, were you going to monitor the questions for us? Yes, so Armando and I are um, going to see in the chat box. And so I don't see anything as of yet, but anyone okay. is uh, welcome to type in anything as they come to you. Okay, thank right. you. I just put in a notice that people are, well, our questions are welcome. So. Okay, so we'll go on to Proposition 15. Okay, so Proposition 15 is com commercial property taxes for schools and communities. It's a citizen initiative, a constitutional amendment, which means that they uh, got petition signatures to put this on on the uh, ballot this year. The background is that in 1978, voters passed Proposition 13. Commercial and, and residential property tax was limited to 1% of the purchase price, tax increases limited to 2% of the purchase per year, unless a person or entity acquires more than 50% of ownership interest. Companies like Chevron or Disneyland pay taxes on property assessments from the 1970s currently because they've never uh, have never uh, sold any of their interest more than 50%. And part of the reason that property taxes remain so low on commercial and industrial property is that they um, they are turned over a lot less often than residential properties are. So market value, of course, as we know in the Bay Area, has risen much more than the assessment value. Commercial and industrial property usually is owned longer. Uh, so two thirds of the tax benefit has gone to business, not homeowners. So the question is, should the California Constitution be amended to that most commercial and industrial properties be reassessed on a regular basis. And in order for this to pass, it will require a majority approval. The effect on the next slide is the commercial property over $3 million worth value would be reassessed at market value. This would not cause a change to taxes on residential homes but it would begin in 2022. It would be phased in gradually. Uh, commercial property would be then be reassessed every three years 
at the current market value or when sold. Exceptions, ex exceptions where the rate would not increase on any homes or living spaces are not affected, even if the apartments are, loan, are owned by large landowners. That includes multi-use properties where there's living space above um, commercial space. Small businesses who have revenues uh, less than 3 million and agriculture, agriculture or religious land. The fiscal benefit, the fiscal effects that it would raise approximately 6.5 to 11.5 billion dollars per year in commercial property taxes. And the range is large because it's hard to estimate how much commercial property will be worth each year. Uh, the dollars after costs would be spent 60% to local governments and 40% to school districts and community colleges, raising per student funding by approximately $100 per year. Go ahead and next slide. So on this slide, since uh, October 3rd, there's been an update in the amount of money that's been spent on this. Actually, 41 million has been spent on the four campaign, primarily from the California Teachers Association, the SEIU Union, San Francisco Foundation, California Federation of Teachers, plus the others listed below. But those were the primary funders. And there's been about 31 million spent uh, opposing this particular proposition, primarily the California Business Roundtable, development companies, manufactured housing, and um, the California Taxpayers Union. Some of the Black and Hispanic Chambers of Commerce and the Small Business Association, rest, uh, small Association Restaurant Association. So you wonder why some of these people oppose or are for or against. Well, the pro side of the argument is saying that these commercial and industrial companies should pay their fair share of taxes based on what the property is worth because of the lack of turnover in commercial and industrial property and that this particular Prop 13, that it was, um, it was intended for homeowners, um, but there was a small loophole and this is what they want to close. That they're also saying that the burden of property tax revenue, which is the primary funding source for our schools and some of our, lo um, our local government services is falling on residential property taxes, uh, particularly recent buyers. Uh, and this, that gap can be closed by um, reassessing commercial and industrial property. And there, there, it keeps the protections for homeowners and renters and farmers. So it's not affecting the other um, valuable assets of Proposition 13, just closing this particular loophole. The opponents to this um, say that higher business taxes are going to raise the cost of everything because commercial and industrial landowners, of course, will pass on their cost to consumers. And it, they also felt that it's hard for um, small businesses because many small businesses rent, uh, rent uh, uh, business space from these commercial and industrial properties and they will have a hard time meeting their um, rent if, they, if these companies are um, taxed, that rent will go up and it will be a burden on those small businesses, even though those small businesses themselves will not be taxed if they are renting from a commercial or industrial property, they will, be t uh, will have increased rents. The other um, con is that the legislature can and should change these rules to close the loopholes without having to have a new constitutional amendment um, 
pass through to do that because they do have that ability at the legislative uh, level and that lobbyists and others can help with um, crafting new legislation rather than doing a constitutional amendment. So what does your vote mean? Yes means to raise uh, tax business property taxes on commercial and industrial properties over 3 million uh, starting in 2022. And no vote is to leave the proposition, Prop 13 um, as it is and do not ta raise taxes on business properties. Any questions? Um, Linda, I yeah. um, can I just backtrack a little bit? We have a couple questions from Webster regarding the proposition before this one, number 14 on the stem cell research. He's asking, Certainly. Yeah, no problem. Thank, thank you. He's asking, is it true that only two treatments have been approved since 2004? I think it was that f few have been. Let me, let me look back at my notes. Um, so again, these are the, the pros. You have the, uh, those for and those against. So opponents are saying that um, previous funding has not yielded the promised results. So I'm not sure that there, uh, that there were two. Um, Another thing that if it's helpful, Webster, is I could look up articles on it from the National Institute of Health and maybe email them to him too. I'm not quite sure either about the number of... Yeah, I don't think that there's two. I may have, maybe I wasn't speaking um, clearly. Uh, but yeah, so I don't see anywhere that it was just two. There's been, um, let's see, it'll increase... Yeah, saying it's for research and treatment, but it, there's not any number that was given. So maybe I didn't, uh, maybe I didn't speak clearly, but there have, you know, it, it, research has been um, going on for clinical trials using stem cell um, and continuing, you know, the, so the, the measure, the proposition is to request to continue the funding for, but it's not, it's not been limited to two. Okay. Thank you, Helen. And the next one is, is this mainly uh, just going to go over what is in the information guide that we received? I would say, so what Helen and I did and what the league had asked us to do in these presentations is to review the um, League of Women Voters California Education Fund um, information on the Voters Edge, which is their um, uh, their online website and also the pros and cons uh, handout and um, to do a little background research as necessary to kind of give a full picture but we are um, and looking through to the official voter registration guide so that we can give sort of a comprehensive look but yes a lot of it is um, based on the information that is available to you that we're uh, just bringing through in this in this presentation. So I think we did, did we forward along the pros and cons, the League of Women Voters? Um, did we forward this along prior to, I think? Patty, I think I we don't, did. Um, no, we have not, but we will be mailing them to everybody and we'll okay. be having them available. If you uh, do not want the e-version, we'll have them at our curbside pickup, uh, okay. which is going to be on Wednesdays through Fridays. Thank you. We have another question that popped up in the chat box from Jacqueline. This is a really, this is really a tough proposition. I, I believe she's thinking of 15 because though it's good to tax the larger businesses for their spaces, it's bad for the small businesses and that's not good. So it is hard to make a choice. You're choosing either to better schools, et cetera, but at the detriment of small businesses that is said to be the backbone of American economy. True? 
Yes. And I think that it, that is true. And it's one of the reasons that you want to make sure that you're really looking at the propositions and looking at the pros and cons um, because you get the perspective from both sides because on one hand, uh, the commercial businesses are going to be paying a higher share of property taxes, which will fund a lot of uh, services um, for in the local government and also funding the schools and cr increasing the because of the way that we fund schools it's based on property taxes and um, but if, if in commercial and industrial businesses are going to be passing on their costs to their tenants or their consumers then there is a chance that uh, those small businesses who are being who will be affected those that uh, rent from industrial commercial properties. So it is important that you understand that there are two sides to this argument and then make a, you know, make a dis an informed decision about what you think is the uh, most, most important, uh, most important way to vote. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. It is a very hot topic. We have another question from Joyce. On Prop 15, can you restate how this got on the ballot? Was it an initiative petition? Yes, it was. It was a citizen's initiative. So there were ballot, there were uh, signatures, petition signatures collected. Uh, there were enough signatures to actually put this on the ballot as a constitutional amendment. Okay, thank you. And I believe that is it for now. But as we mentioned, if things pop up, please use the chat box. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So that last uh, question was a, a good segue. We are now going to launch uh, for the next four propositions, 16, 17, 18, and 19. Um, these are um, placed on the ballot by the state legislature. So the remaining, the other seven, so the two we saw heard previously, and then those at the end, um, were gathered by uh, sufficient signatures by supporters wanting to make change. So this is a legislative um, legislative constitutional amendment. Sorry, I should have gone. So Prop 16, um, it allows diversity as a factor in public employment, education, and contracting decisions. The question is, should California and local government entities be allowed to consider diversity as a factor in public employment, education, and contracting decisions. So the situation is, uh, before 1996, California had programs to increase opportunities and representation for people who faced inequalities based on sex, race, gender, ethnicity, or national origin, referred to as affirmative action programs. When Prop 209 was approved in 1996, these programs were generally banned. Some universities and public entities continue to use characteristics or situations not banned by Proposition 209 to increase diversity. So the proposal is Prop 16 would repeal the section of the California Constitution introduced by Prop 209 in 1996, thus eliminating the ban on consideration of race, color, sex, ethnicity, or national origin in public education, employment, and in contracting. As a result, state and local entities could make policies and programs that would consider these attributes as long as being consistent with equal protection clause. So the fiscal effects, Prop 16 would have no direct fiscal effect on state and local entities because the major measure would require, would not require any change to current policies or programs. So those who are for Supporters say yes on 16 means equal opportunities for all Californians. They say that despite living in the most diverse state in the nation, women and people of color are still di um, di discriminated against. And that we are at a historic moment and need to strengthen California by overturning discrimination in all areas. So following the money here, you can see um, who has put money in aside from you know, some private investors. There's California Works Committee, Chinese Affirmative Action, uh, skipping down ACLU, the CEIU. Those who are against 
our Students for Fair Admissions, American Civil Liberties Institute, and the American Freedom Alliance. So the pros I, I had covered, opponents say that Proposition 16 would be a step backward. It would be allowing government to favor a particular group. They also say, let's not perpetuate the stereotype that minorities and women can't make it unless they get special treatment. The opponents also say that Prop 16 will require costly bureaucracies to enforce its provisions, burdening taxpayers. So those are the pros and the cons. Your yes vote would mean to permit state affirmative action. Your no vote means to forbid state affirmative action. So any questions on that? It is basically repealing portions of the uh, 2000, 2009, up 209. Okay, Helen and Linda, we actually have a little backtracking to do. We have more questions on Prop 15. I'll go in the order that I saw. Um, let's see. Uh, we have one from Chris. He says, seems like higher taxes mean higher costs for the large businesses. They may want to pass on their costs, but supply and demand impact the price they can charge. They may be forced to take a smaller margin. Right now, I believe that might have been rents are going down due to Prop 15. And that's the end of the question. Oh, you're muted, Linda. Um, I, was that a question? Uh, or was, was that yeah. a statement? I think, actually, you're right. I think it is just a statement that he's I, making. Yeah, I, yes. Okay, so that is a statement. Uh, there's another question. Um, schools regarding 15. Schools are also already receiving funding, don't they? Going back to Prop 15. Um, let's see. Yeah. Yes, she, they, they're um, asking a question. Aren't schools already receiving the funding? Yes. Schools already receive funding based on a formula that's based on property taxes. Um, that's, uh, I don't know the exact formula, but it is property taxes, which is one of the, um, one of the reasons that the um, proponents of the Proposition 15 feel that currently uh, homeowners and residential property taxes is actually paying the burden of uh, property taxes for state services and schools. And that that's one of the reasons that they felt that this proposition should be approved so that uh, we could, they could close what they see as the loophole for commercial and industrial property. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question regarding our format tonight. Uh, Jane is wondering, would it work to take the questions at the very end of the whole presentation? Also wondering if this will be available as a video. Yes, to everybody who joined a little bit late, we will be having this as a video. It will be running um, a bit past seven. So if you cannot make it, we will have it on our website and our YouTube channel, and we'll be promoting it on our um, social media platforms. But to, to the question regarding the format of our questions being answered, um, I guess we could. I'm, I'm wondering. We're fine with whatever works, you know. Whatever works for you. The other option, of course, is that all questions could come in. They could then be posted at a later time. If people wanted to um, check in, you could post a document or something like that as well. Okay, so I think that might be the best. Everything is being recorded in the chat box and we can uh, probably just ask at the very end so that we can let you have continual um, coverage of all of this. Okay. Um, thank right. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And we have one on 16. Uh, what does 16, what does it actually mean? Companies would have to cover a percentage of certain types of people? I guess my, uh, the different minority sets maybe? No, so they would have to, um, it's, it's not any, any fiscal, it's that they would have to give consideration um, 
to hiring and awarding contracts, um, they can look at, uh, you know, more females, more people of color. Um, so they can look at that. Previously, they were not able to look at or reference at all um, anyone's origin. And so um, this is allowing them to look at that. So it's kind of going back to a middle ground, if you were, uh, if you will, um, as to what it was prior to Proposition 209 back in 96. They're feeling that those were too astringent and is um, actually limiting, you know, the, the equal, equal uh, admission to schools, um, hiring and awarding of contracts. Okay. We so it's loosening it up a little. Does that, did that answer the question? I hope that answers the question, um, Jacqueline. Yes, she said, thank you so much. Okay. And uh, we have a response. Uh, the video will be uploaded to our site in our little voter toolbox. So we, we might be able to email people too. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so on to um, Proposition 17, which is allowing parolees to vote. And this is, as um, Helen said, a, a state legislature put this on the ballot. As it is a constitutional amendment. And the question is, should people on parole in California be allowed to register to vote and vote in elections? The current law says felons can vote only after completing both prison and parole. And this is, these are felons that are in California state prisons people in county jails or on county probation can already vote. Uh, the effect is that of Prop 17, that felons could vote when out of prison, but still on parole, which is often a three or more years. In addition, the Prop 17 says they may also run for an elected office if qualified and that there are currently 500,000 on state parole. The fiscal effects is that they create a one-time workload for the state to update the voter registration systems to reflect that people on parole may register to vote. It's, on the like, it's likely to result in one-time state costs of hundreds of thousands of dollars about 1% of the, of the state's current general fund budget. So there's, uh, this has been updated as well on, as of October 3rd, about a million 100,000 has been spent on the um, for prop, Proposition 17. Uh, of course, a number of state legislatures uh, were instrumental in helping to get this on the ballot. The California ACLU and also the California League of Women Voters. The California League actually has two parts. There's a nonprofit education fund, which does the uh, nonpartisan part, but there's also a 501c4 that does advocate on behalf of certain propositions. There has been no money spent against this particular proposition, but the election integrity project um, has come out against. And the, uh, the proponents say that people on parole should pay ta uh, to pay taxes and that they should be able to vote if you if you have to if you work and have to pay taxes you should be able to vote and that voting connects reconnects people to their community so it tends to increase public safety um, the opponents say that people should complete parole before voting that parole time is for criminals to prove they've changed and state parole is for serious and violent criminals giving them social equality before rehabilitation will add to the victim's pain and suffering. So your vote on 17 is allow parolees to vote 
or don't allow parolees to vote. Okay, we'll go on to 18. Okay, very good. Proposition 18 is dealing with um, questioning whether some 17 year olds should be allowed to vote in uh, primary and special elections. The question is, should 17 year olds who will be 18 by a general election be allowed to vote in the primary and special elections in that election cycle? So currently California holds primary and general elections in even numbered years. In the primary election, voters decide which candidates will compete in the general election. The general election determines which people will hold elected office. So in order to vote, a person must be 18 years of age at the time of the election. The proposal would be for Prop 18 would allow certain 17 year olds citizens to vote. If a person is 17, year old, 17 years old and they will be 18 by the next general election, they will be able to vote in the primary election and any special uh, elections which occur prior to the general election as well. The fiscal effect there would be hundreds of thousands of dollars each election cycle at the county level to pay for extra voting materials and education um, election official time. Hundreds of thousands of dollars less than 1% of the budget at the state level to update voter registration systems. So supporters uh, are California Association of Student Councils. Those against are the Election Integrity Park Project of California. Those in favor say that Prop 18 will allow 17 and 18 year olds to participate in a full election cycle. It'll boost the number of youth who actually vote. 17 and 18 year olds are heavily affected by policies, so they should be able to vote on those policies. They're saying when a 17 year old cannot vote in the primary, it discourages them from voting in the general election when they're 18 because they didn't pick the candidates that are on the ballot. Supporters also say that it encourages young people to be involved in the lifelong journey of voting and it's one of the most, which is one of the most essential factors in democracy. Those who are against it, the opponents to Prop 18, say that it allows 17 year olds to vote in primaries on tax issues and debt issues. It is not right because they have not paid taxes and they'll be biased by who influences them. They're saying that 17-year-olds are too young to vote and need more life experience before they are ready. 17-year-olds' brains are not fully developed in the logic and reasoning portion, so they'd just be making bad decisions. Opponents also say that schools would persuade 17-year-olds to vote on one side or the other by putting up posters or having teachers advocate for certain policies. They also say that there are only 18 other states that currently allow 17 year olds to vote. So a yes vote would see, say that uh, on Prop 18 is that you want to allow 17 year olds to vote um, in a primary and special elections if they will be 18 by the time of the general election. Your no vote will say that you do not agree with this and, and that the 17 year olds should wait until the next uh, election time period when they are 18. So that is Proposition 18. On to 19. Okay, so we're going to talk about Proposition 19, which is property tax changes, home protection for seniors, severely disabled families, and victims of wildfire and natural disasters act. It's from the state legislature and it is a constitutional amendment. So the question is, should the California Constitution be changed to modify the rules for transferring, transitioning property tax assessed values and use and use any resulting new tax revenues for fire suppression efforts, schools and local governments. So the current situation is when seniors, uh, when seniors, adults over 55 homeowners move the tax value of their next home remains the same as their old home rather than rising to the market value of the new home if they purchase within the same county or one of the 10 existing counties that allow the transition. 
uh, there is some history on this. There, Proposition 5, which was on the 2018 ballot, was defeated. And it would have a lot, excuse me, seniors and disabled persons to transfer tax assessment, no matter what the new home value, the location in the state, or the number of moves. But that was defeated back in 2018. So, excuse me while I change my page. The transfer, this is a little bit of a, a chart of talks about what the new old rules were and what the new rules will be under Prop 19. So under the current rule, the value of the new home in order to transition and to retain the um, same tax assessment value, it has to be less or the same value. Under Prop 19, it would be the less value, the same value, or a higher value. Uh, currently, you can transition your tax value to 10 counties. I, unfortunately, I don't have the names of those 10, but there are currently 10 counties that allows you to move uh, from one county to the other and take your tax assessment with you. Prop 19 <clears throat> would allow you to move to any California county. And the number of transfers during your lifetime, currently it's one for seniors, but it must happen within two years of uh, selling the, uh, your previous home and uh, one for disaster and displaced and disabled. And then the new law is one for disaster displaced and three for seniors or disabled. So this, this does make a significant change for, for uh, those folks. However, this is a two-part, uh, next slide please, this is a two-part measure, ballot measure, and it also infects the inheritance clause that's currently in the, in the current law. The current situation is when a home or a farm is inherited by children, uh, they inherit the original lower tax value and the lower top poverty tax assessment uh, and its children or grandchildren and that lower tax value continues. But Prop 19 will eliminate an inherited lower tax assessment unless the family lives in the home full time. They can no longer rent it out. Um, so after February of 2023, the tax on the, this family land would increase to market value it's a, if it's over a million dollars of its original taxable value. <coughs> so this is a, a big change to uh, the inheritance clause that's in the current law. So the next, this next slide talks a little bit about, shows you a little bit about this effects on inherited homes of higher value. And it looks at, you know, the initial person's price way down in the lower left-hand corner, which a lot of times if folks are inheriting property, their family may have lived in a home for a long period of time its market value has increased significantly, but its assessed value has remained, um, particularly if it was assessed under the Proposition 13, uh, where it's 1% of the purchase price and 2% per year. The assessed value can be quite different from the actual market value. So if it is inherited and it's 1 million or more, over the uh, assessed value, then it is reassessed at the new market rate and that <clears throat> the 
tax value then increases and the property taxes are increased to market value. Go ahead and change the next slide. So they did an analysis, USA Today, looking at the number of million dollar, percentage of million dollar homes in California in three of its largest cities, Los Angeles, Oakland, and San Francisco. And as you can tell from the slide, it continues to increase and that the, the uh, number of million dollar homes is continuing to rise every year. And in San Francisco, you can see that over 80% of the homes in San Francisco are over a million dollars from their assessed value. Okay. Excuse me. So the budget affects the cities and schools. Again, this is another property tax uh, property tax uh, change. The cities and schools would get uh, less property tax from, some, from a few homes, um, but more money from many homes, particularly inherited homes that are converted to rental income. Uh, if the family chooses not to live in the home upon inheritance. Uh, this, of course, would then provide more money for schools and for local services. And some new money in this particular um, property, uh, this particular proposition is earmarked for firefight, firefighting uh, suppression. And um, that would limit some of the budget flexibility because once you earmark money for a specific topic that that money can no longer be shifted in the general fund to cover anything else. So who's supporting this? It's uh, the California Association of Realtors is the big supporter and they've put about $41 million into this. Uh, particular proposition. And uh, the California professional firefighters, because they know that there's some money that could be earmarked for them, which is, uh, and the National Association of Realtors. Those against, as of October 3rd, have spent about 45,000. Uh, East Bay Times, the Mercury News, and the Orange County Register, some of the uh, larger newspapers in in our area and Southern California. So what do they say? Um, so the proponents say that, that uh, folks who need to downsize, particularly seniors, disabled, or those affected by uh, natural disasters should not have to pay higher taxes on their next home if they lose their homes or if they need to downsize or uh, need to move to be closer to family or things like that uh, as, they, as they age. It also closes loopholes on inherited homes that are rented out. And according to the, um, the LA County, about 60% of the inherited homes are not lived in by the family relatives but are rented out. Uh, and then would need to be reassessed at market value if over a million dollars of the assessed value. They also say that they feel that, you know, even though that is a, a change in the tax value of a rental property, if families are renting and collecting rents, then they could uh, conceivably cover any tax increases that that would cost them. The cons say that voters rejected this uh, increase in 2008. It should not be back on the ballot. That it doesn't really do anything to help low income seniors or disabled um, or to create more housing for, uh, for people. And it can hurt families, particularly families of inherited property who cannot pay higher taxes on an inherited family home and are forced to sell. 
So your vote on this one means to change the property tax transfer laws and to close the loopholes on the inherited properties. And your no vote is to keep the property tax transfer laws and uh, transfer of inherited properties the same. Okay, on to Proposition 20. Proposition 20 proposes to, chain, to uh, make changes in criminal penalties and parole. And the question is, should California law be amended to make changes to the process by which people are charged with certain crimes and the process for granting them parole? So the situation is that California has passed three measures intended to reduce the state prison population as ordered by the courts. The measures have brought the overall state population below 137.5% of capacity as ordered by the Supreme Court. Many individual prisons are still operating above that percentage. So the proposal would be, Prop 20 would change provisions of the measures passed to lower the state prison population. It allows certain theft or fraud crimes to be charged as felony or misdemeanor. It requires collecting DNA, including for some misdemeanors. It establishes parole criteria for nonviolent offenders and makes other changes to the parole process. It expands the list of crimes classified as violent. The fiscal effects, uh, we have the, some would be uh, punished as petty theft, cutting back, so I've kind of reviewed this. Prop 20 would increase state and local costs tens of millions of dollars annually as it would result in an increase in the prison population and the way that uh, post-released supervision is handled. We have here where the money is, who is for, who is against, uh, Sheriff's Department, police officers, LA Police Protection League, and Albertsons and Safeway. Those against are private citizens, ACLU of Northern California, and the Governor Brown Committee. So the supporters say that Prop 20 reclassifies certain client crimes, that California laws aren't tough enough now. So they uh, don't want to let violent criminals get early, early parole. So it reclassifies certain crimes like assault with a deadly weapon, date rape, and child ab abuse as violent. Prop 20 would not increase the prison population. It would only ensure that people convicted of these crimes serve their full sentence. The Prop 20 will help stop car break-ins, shoplifting, and other theft that has been on the rise. Those who are against it say that uh, Prop 20 will roll back prison reforms and cost taxpayers millions of dollars annually. They're stating that California already has some of the toughest um, statutes against violent crime. Millions of dollars for prisons could be spent on education, healthcare, or affordable housing. The op opponents also say that Prop 20 slashes mental health and rehabilitation programs that help to prepare people for release from prison and reduce repeat offenses. Prop 20 will result in extreme sentences for petty theft and will disproportionately impact vulnerable minorities. So these are the opponents of your yes vote on Prop 20 will make laws harder on crime. Your no vote will say to keep the laws as they are currently. And with that, we move on to Prop Proposition 21. Okay, Proposition 21, um, allow more rent controls. It's the local rent control initiative this is, now we are back, this is a citizen initiative to change a state law. Uh, uh, signatures were collected and it requires a 50% majority to pass. So the question, should current state law be changed to allow cities and counties to apply rent control to housing 15 years old or older and limit rent increase to 15% once a new renter moves in. So the current law is the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act. 
and it limits how much cities can uh, limit. So it limits how much cities can limit rent increases or impose rent controls. It does allow landlords to receive a fair market of return. And it says that the uh, rent controls will never apply to single family homes, new construction after 1995, and that landlords will be able to receive, uh, will be able to increase the rent once a new renter moves in. So a third, according to the background on this, about a third of California renters pay 50% of their income for housing. And that proponents say high rents add to homelessness, partly because of the, the rental problem is because the demand for housing is still exceeds supply. The effect of prop 21 is that allows cities to limit rent increases in more situations. This part of the history is that California Prop 10 in 2018 was a local rent control initiative, but it was defeated. So it, that uh, gave cities more leeway to impose rent controls. On the next page, it shows a chart of the current uh, Costa-Hawkins Act and the Prop 21. So the age of the, of the rental property, uh, currently it's, you can only have rent control on properties that are 30 years old or older. Uh, the Prop 21 will make those 15 years old or older. If new tenants move in, is what increase is allowed? Currently, any amount is allowed. So a new, the landlord can increase it to any amount. Under Prop 21, the allowed increase is 5% above the prior rent for the first three years for a total of 15%. Ongoing tenants, does it allow a cost of living rise? Yes, for Costa Hawkins and yes for Prop 21. Exemptions, there's no limits on, there's no single family homes included. And uh, in addition to Prop 21, there are no single family homes, but there are also, um, if you own only one or two residential units as a landlord, uh, it does not apply to you. And the sunset on this particular um, law, Costa Hawkins has no sunset and Prop 21 would sunset in 2030 if approved. So the, the financial effects, it could lower, it could lower city income because landlords would pay less in business taxes because they collect less rent. However, there's a strong four, uh, as of October 3rd, 24 million has been collected. Uh, the AIDS Healthcare Foundation run by Michael Weidenstein California Nurses Association, Bernie Sanders, Dolores Welta, California Democrats, SEIU, Democratic Socialists, and the Eviction Network all are in favor of this rent control measure. There's been about 54 million raised against uh, California's for responsible housing, uh, California Business Roundtable, X, XX Property Trust, Avalon Bay Communities, R&B Management Corporation, and Prometheus Real Estate. So what do the pros and cons say on this? Well, rent control will help families and seniors stay in their homes. And it's fair, guarantees that landlords can still earn a profit. 
rent control, the cons say that rent control cause, can cause eviction, less maintenance, and fewer new buildings. Um, each year, new buildings would be added to the list of those that can do rent controls as buildings reach their 15-year age and transition to buildings um, that are eligible for rent control. Propos Proposition 21 will make housing less available during these hard economic times, according to uh, opponents. So what does your vote say? Let's enlarge the options for rent controls. This would be cities and state uh, cities and counties that could enact these rent controls and keep the rent controls the same under the Costa Hawkins Rent Control Act. Okay. Prop 22. It is the app based drivers and contractors proposition. The question is, should app-based rideshare and delivery drivers be classified as independent contractors, not employees? And should rideshare and delivery companies be required to adopt labor and wage policies unique to these drivers? So the situation is that between 800,000 and 950,000 Californians are rideshare or app-based delivery drivers. They choose when and where they work but most provide their own car and cover their own independent expenses. They're classified as independent contractors, so do not, uh, do not receive legal protection or benefits provided to employees. AB 5 passed in 2019 limits the ability of companies to hire workers as contractors and requires these drivers to be hired as employees with protection and benefits. So the proposition Proposal would be Prop 22 would reclassify app-based drivers as independent contractors, not employees, unless a company sets hours, requires drivers to accept certain rides, deliveries, or restricts working for other companies. Drivers would not receive employment benefits or protection. Instead, companies would be required to provide minimum compensation, a healthcare stipend, medical expense coverage if injured while uh, driving, arrest policy, and implementation of certain harassment and other policies. The fiscal effects would be to lower the cost uh, and higher profits for rideshare delivery companies. I'm behind on a slide here or two. <laughs> um, so drivers, uh, independent contractors would get a 120% of minimum wage, some reimbursement for health care, and some help with it with maintenance. Um, they don't get overtime independent contractors. They don't pay, get paid for wait time, um, no paid sick leave, et cetera. They don't have the right to unionize. So those, uh, again, there's the lower, the fiscal effects are stated to be lower costs and higher profits for ride share and delivery companies. Driver and stockholders will pay more income taxes. As far as who is for, obviously uh, there on the left is gonna be the Lyft, the Uber, the DoorDash, the Instacart, and the Postmates. I think we've all seen these commercials on TV. Those who are against are the Transportation Workers Union, AFL-CIO, CEIU, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, and Gig Workers Rising. So that's where the money is, is being um, focused on both sides. The pros say that, that drivers want to be independent contractors and that um, they're forcing companies to hire employees would end hundreds of thousands of jobs. So classifying drivers as employees required under AB5 would lead to longer wait times, higher prices, and less access to ride share and delivery services. Like AB5, Prop 22 would improve delivery and ride share work by requiring companies to provide new benefits and expand public safety precautions. The opponents say that um, this would eliminate the basic workplace protections and replace them with lower guaranteed earnings and healthcare subsidies to save costs for the company. Current law does not limit driver flexibility. A majority of drivers work 30 or more hours per week. So as employees, drivers would get benefits they deserve uh, such as pay and unemployment. 
So those are the pros and cons. A yes vote means that app drivers are independent contractors and companies um, and voters make the employment law. The no vote is that app drivers are employees and legislature and courts make the employment law. Okay, on to Prop 23. Uh, more re regulations for the kidney dialysis clinics. It's a citizen initiative, uh, state law. And the question, should outpatient dialysis clinics be required to have a physician on site at all hours when patients are being treated, offer the same level of care to all patients, regardless of insurance, and report infection-related information. Uh, the situation is uh, people suffering from end-stage renal disease, the final stage of kidney disease, must receive dialysis to survive. Uh, dialysis filters out the waste from, and toxins from the blood, and it is typically done in a clinic. Uh, three times a week with, and with each treatment lasting up to about four hours. Um, and usually there are two primary uh, private for-profit companies, Davida Kidney Care and for Census Medical Care, own most of the clinics in California. There's about 600 licensed clinics. Uh, the Service Employees International Union, SEIU, would like to unionize these companies, improve care, and cap company profits. In 2018, Prop 8 uh, was on the ballot to cap dialysis clinic profits, but that was defeated. California Department of Public Health uh, certifies these 600 clinics using federal standards that, current, that do not include staffing, number of hours uh, open, or ratios of patients to specialists. A patients uh, under the current public health rule, a patient's personal doctor must visit the patient at least once a month while they are in uh, receiving treatment. So the effects, it would require a licensed doctor on site during treatment, during emergencies doc or doctor shortage, a nurse or physician assistant would be acceptable. They would have to accept patients regardless of patient type Medicare, Medi-Cal, or private pay are the three primary ways that uh, patients pay. However, Medicare and Medi-Cal do have a cap on the amount that they will pay for a patient's dialysis, <clears throat> which must be then accepted by the clinic, depending on the person's uh, health insurance. And they would need state permission to cut or services or to close. They would also um, have penalties for not reporting information about infections. So the, there's about 6 million for SEIU is the primary contractor. The, almost the entire 6 million has been raised by them. And about 2 million has been raised against primarily the DeVita Incorporated for Census Medical, they're the largest dialysis companies, but also the American College of Surgeons, the California Medical Association, California American Vets, and the California American Legion. So what do the pros and cons say? Well, dialysis, the pros say dialysis is a dangerous uh, and complicated procedure that a doctor should always be there. It is, uh, the procedure is done in a clinic primarily by a um, 
kidney dialysis uh, technician, a trained technician, a technician, but they're not a doctor. Um, and it also that this proposition prevents financial discrimination uh, and reporting on infections to the state health department encourages improvement of services and cleanliness in the clinics. This reporting that they're currently doing, that they are required to do reporting, um, but this particular um, proposition um, increases some of the penalties for inaccurate or delayed reporting. It goes to the National Healthcare Safety Network of the Centers for D Disease Control. Con the opponents say that Prop 23 would take doctors away from hospitals and emergency rooms, which is one of the reasons why some of the surgeons are um, opponents to this particular <clears throat> proposition. And that doctors are not necessarily you know, cost more, so some clinics might have to close or increase costs because of the increased costs and the inability for Medicare or Medi-Cal to um, meet the higher costs. And they also feel that the um, dialysis clinics are already regulated and provide a high quality of care and that they should not uh, be subjected to this additional um, scrutiny. So what does your vote mean? Your yes vote means there would be more regulations placed on the dialysis clinics and your no vote means that the dialysis clinics will continue to be uh, regulated per federal standards uh, and there would be no change. Okay, 24. Proposition 24 deals with changes to consumer privacy law. The question is, shall an existing law from 2018, the California Consumer Privacy Act, be amended to increase penalty on companies that fail to follow regulations, to allow consumers more easily to opt in and out of sharing their data, uh, changes criteria for which businesses need to comply, <coughs> and to create a new enforcement arm that would cost 10 million. So internet companies commonly collect uh, and store and sell personal information to advertisers. And some of the information can include uh, cell phone locations, persons, race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation, private internet messages, and some health information as well as pregnancy. So in 2018, the legislature passed an internet privacy protection law that allowed consumers to understand what data is stored, to request deletion of it, and to opt out of it being sold. So the, with Prop 24, consumers would have the right to correct misinformation held on websites and also to select the uh, don't share or sell my private information from this website, companies would be allowed to charge more to provide privacy. They would collect and share your information if you go out of state. So it uh, creates California Consumer Protection Agency. So those who are for is a private entity, Alice Dermataggart, the American Federation of State Employees, California Building and Inst Construction, California Professional Firefighters, California NAACP, and the Peace and Freedom Party. Those who are against are the Dolores Huerta Foundation, Consumer Federation of California, Public Citizens, Mercury News, and the Republican Party of California. So those who are for, uh, Prop 24, want to stop tech companies from tracking everything we do online. It said it would pre present, uh, prevent businesses from using or sharing sensitive data about your health, finances, race, in a ethnicity, and precise location. It would have fire, higher and faster fines for violations to enter to companies that did not comply. 
and it creates a, a new privacy protection agency. So the opponents say that loopholes in this 52 pages of this proposition give too much power to the tech companies. It's a burden on the consumer to opt out of countless intrusive data collecting practices one by one that companies are currently barred from by default. Companies may charge more for privacy protection. Consumers have to opt out one website at a time. So it's, the opponents say that Prop 24 would allow employees to keep gathering data about things like employees, pregnancy, religion, or political activism. So what your yes vote or no vote means, yes may, vote means to change the existing 2018 law, and a no vote says take time to evaluate the 2018 law. On to Proposition 25, our final proposition. Okay, so we're, we're here at the end. This is Proposition 25. It's to <clears throat> replace the cash bail with risk assessments. This is a citizen initiative referendum. Uh, this was the, in 2018, the California legislature passed SB 10, a law which was should to end cash bail. Citizens went to uh, get petition signatures to block the passage of this bill. It has not gone into effect because it's been blocked. Uh, and the referendum is asking the voters to accept, reject or accept the law and not just have the legislature pass it. The current situation if suspects are allowed home <coughs> while awaiting their if they're awaiting their court date, bail bonds help assure they'll return on time. If suspects pay bail and return on time, they get all their money back. The system put a heavier burden on low income suspects if because if they can't afford bail they wait in jail or borrow from a bail's bond dealer and pay a non-refundable fee of about 10 percent if they're return on time and proven innocent they they get their bail bond back but do not get back the 10 percent borrowing fee which they are responsible to repay so the new system, it replaces this ca uh, cash bail bond bail system with a, a computer generated risk assessment where suspects wait for court date would depend on their risk to others. Uh, and the risk that suspect won't will return to court. If they won't return to court, there's a high risk, they wait in jail. If there's a low risk, they wait at home. If there's a medium risk, the judge and the risk assessment decide jail or home uh, with a tracking device or probation check-in could be required. So this particular cash bail system, it's really looking at the um, seriousness of the crime as to whether or not they're going to return uh, to court and uh, that assessment is a, from a computer generated uh, program, but the judge does have final say in making those determinations. So who's for this and who's against? So about 11 million have actually been spent as of October 3rd. Uh, Action Now Initiative, various private citizens, SEIU again, uh, Public Defenders, California Democratic Party, California League of Women Voters, California Teachers Association, and Next Gen of California. 
Those against, as you might suspect, are the bail bond agencies, Triton Management, Lexington National Insurance, Bankers Insurance, Financial Casualty, A1A Holdings, Bail Agents Associations. There are many counties in Southern California against it, and the California NAACP and Black and Hispanic Chambers of Commerce, plus the Howard Jarvis taxpayers. So what do the pros say? So the decisions will be based on public safety, not on a person's uh, ability to pay. The current system is unfair. If you can't pay, you stay in jail. Also, if you take a bond and later you're found not guilty or not charged, you still have a large debt to pay off, which is that 10% of bond. And it gives judges more discretion in assessing risk as they use the risk assessment tool, computer generated tool to evaluate. The, the opponents say that uh, releasing people from jail will make communities less safe and decisions uh, may be made by computer programs which have historically discriminated against African Americans, racially and social economically biased. That's uh, one of the things the NAACP and the Black, Hispanic, uh, Black and Hispanic Chambers are saying. They also indicate that it's cost taxpayers millions of, uh, millions of dollars. It burdens the courts and creates a whole new bureaucracy. And it removes an important mechanism for in ensuring that defendants appear. And that's one of the arguments from the Southern California sheriffs is that that, that lives more leeway for people not to appear in court. Whereas if they do have a bail uh, on a, a home or they put money towards it, that they feel they're more likely to appear. So, So the setting up the budget effects may be setting up a new assessment system will be expensive. Overall costs lower with fewer people waiting in jail though. So the costs are, are less, the, the prisons or jails are less crowded. So what does your vote mean? Yes vote means that we will approve SB 10 and end bail bonds the bail bond cash bail system. Your no vote means that we will keep the cash bail system in place. So we're at the end of our uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So we'd like to uh, thank you for allowing us to meet with you tonight. As uh, I said, it, it helps me to educate myself on the different ballots. So it's uh, I'm getting something out of this as well. We want you to uh, know that October 19th is the last day to confirm you are uh, registered to vote or to register to vote. So you can go uh, in order to see your ballot if you want to see the candidates and the measures, polling places, Voters Edge is our, uh, the website we're going to direct you to for that, votersedge.org. It's important that you track your ballot if you're um, voting by mail. You can go and see where your ballot is in the process. I'm seeing on the news that people are already out there, you know, dropping their ballots uh, actually in uh, public libraries. I believe there are boxes in front of most of the public libraries. I know there is here in Castro Valley where you can drop your ballot. So maybe a week or so after you want to track it, make sure it made it in. Um, so uh, you also you can use the the League of Women Voters uh, org is a great resource as well to uh, explain some of the measures and, and answer any questions that you may have. So it looks like we have some questions. Uh, well, as stated, we'd hold them until the end. I think we're ready to, to look at those. It is, um, you know, 7.30 and I'm around. Yes, thank you so much, Helen, and thank you so much, Linda, for making You're very it so accessible. Our it's pleasure. De definitely helpful. Uh, we do have a handful of questions. I'm going to try to do this uh, in order. Okay, we have one from Colleen. Um, let's see. She had it regarding Prop 15. 
Okay, so uh, her question is, I reviewed the League of Women Voters ballot recommendations under Prop 15, all residential property will continue to be exempt from reassessment until it is sold or transferred. Can you confirm that this transfer also applies to inherited residential property held within a trust? In essence, doesn't this mean that Prop 13 property tax assessment benefits expire when the homeowner slash truster dies? So um, Prop 15 uh, talks about the, um, the property taxes for commercial and industrial taxes, but it does not it's not talking about the residential taxes, but we can look at Proposition 19. And uh, uh, so if you, if you purchase the house, uh, if you inherit the house and whether or not you inherit it at the, um, you're asking if you inherit the house, do you get the tax, the tax assessed value? And um, neither one, this one does not talk about that. So that would be a question I would have to do some research on before I could give you a definitive answer. Um, okay. It, yeah. Um, I think we have uh, this uh, patron's uh, email. So we will definitely uh, touch yeah. bases with you, Colleen about this, I think it uh, requires further research. And yeah, we wanna does. make sure we give you an informed answer. Okay, Colleen, so thank you so for your patience. We will get- call, Is that in the chat? Cause I'll, um, I'll look up the question. Yes, it was in the chat. Okay. And um, we can try to connect with her. Uh, let's see. The next one, you did mention 19. We have a, quite a few questions about number 19. Okay. Um, let's see. We have a question in the question box. I don't understand the 2023 clause in the measure, he asks. Can you please explain? I think that might have to do with the February 16, 2023 clause about the taxable value. Right, so the effect of Prop 19. So, so what would happen is if starting after 2023 so it would if with this if this proposition passes the um uh it would not actually the determination of the value of uh from market value and assessed value uh to determine if it's over a million dollars to reclassify the tax base to market value would not actually start until uh, 2023. So for the next, even though uh, we would pass this law here in 2020, the actual um, process of making that evaluation and reassessing property would not actually start until 2023. Okay. Did that answer your question? I hope that answers your question. If, um, if it's still an issue, please uh, continue with the Q&A box. Uh, going through with Prop 19, okay. uh, we have a question from Joyce. I don't understand how realtors would benefit from this. In other, in other words, you said they were supporting a four vote. Do you think they anticipate that this would encourage more homeowners to sell? or that a lot of people would sell inherited property. So that's about 19. And we have a couple more about that too. I think that, um, so, you know, nowadays, if a, if a senior or a disabled person or a, someone subject to disasters has to purchase a new home or move, there aren't, um, uh, they can only move to 10, count, 10 counties within the state and get the favorable tax assessment. They can only do it one time. Uh, they have to buy a home of lesser or equal value. 
So um, I believe that this gives more flexibility to those three uh, categories of citizens who might be moving for, for a variety of reasons. And so it, it um, improves the rental market, it improves the home buying market, but it also it improves the resale, resale market because people leaving former homes, unless it was destroyed by natural disaster or would be selling their existing home, moving and purchasing a new home. And if they also, there's more um, uh, rental property, I think sometimes too, uh, one of the things that the real estate industry does a lot of is, man is manage rental properties. And so uh, if more houses are coming into becoming rental properties, then that is an additional um, avenue of revenue for the realtor, realtor industry. I see. Okay. So that was Joyce's. We have another uh, regarding Prop 19. Mm -hmm. uh, what about a reassessment of a residential property? Would that dramatically affect rents? Um, it's from Tony. A reassessment of a residential property? Yes, and I think it continues for units in multiple properties where long-term tenants pay lower rents and newer tenants pay market value. When those long-term tenants move, can the rents be raised to what the newer tenants pay for like units in the same building? If not, low rent long-term tenants will probably start getting rental increases on a regular basis to catch up. I don't know if that was a statement at the end, but I think um, so that is he talking is, is he relating to the rent control issue? Uh, it sounds like it's a little bit more on prop That's 21. Prop yeah, 21. I, I was reading them in a row. I think you're right, uh, Linda. Sorry about that. There's so many and they're all related. So Tony asked first about the reassessment of a residential property for Prop 19. Would that affect rents? Um, so Prop 19 is, um, well, if they're, so if the person, if the, if the family inherits, inherits a family home, but under Prop 19, you know, 19, if they inherit the family home, but no one in the family is going to live in the home, and the assessment value, the, the assessed value is uh, less, let's see, and the market value is more than a million dollars of the assessed value, that home will be re-evaluated um, re for tax assessment at market value. And so then uh, that, house can be rented out, but the new tax prop, property taxes will be at market value. And that's again, starting in 2023. So they would then be charging probably a higher rent for that particular house that's um, so that they could uh, ensure that they're going to make a profit, but also be able to pay the higher property taxes uh, that are going to be necessary because of the reassessment. I see. Did that, did that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Tony. <laughs> I hope so too. It made sense in my mind. It sounded good. <laughs> <to me. laughs> All right. So, so you know, trying to make sure that people, it seems clear. If anyone, we could go back to that little slide, maybe. Yeah. Because I think let's go see if we can go back that little slide. Thank you. Linda. We're in nineteen. Yeah, it's that the 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 million dollar slide. <laughs> Next one. This one? No, next one. This one. Okay. 
So, because what you can see, so here's the initial purchase price. Say, say you know, your, your mom and dad lived in the house. They bought it for $200,000, let's say. It, it was assessed, you know, uh, at the Prop 13 rate, per se. Uh, and, and now, at the time that, the, that your loved one passed away, it's worth... 350,000, but its market value is like uh, a million five or whatever that is over a million dollars more than its assessed value. Hmm. So you have to then, you know, starting in 2023, the property taxes on that home, if no one in the family is going to be living in the property, the, the property taxes will be reevaluated to market value. So your taxes will then be determined on a million five instead of 300, 350. So it's a, it's a significant increase in property taxes on a inherited home that no one in the family is going to be living in that uh, that you would be renting out and so your rents the rents that you as the homeowner uh, choose to uh, ask for are going to be based on uh, ensuring that you're collecting enough rent to pay uh, taxes on uh, market value of a million five. Does that make sense? Okay, we don't have any. Uh, <laughs> Nobody's we going, have any, huh? <laughs> we believe, I, I know all of these, to tease out the meat of all of this is so um, complex. So I think, hopefully, Tony, if that made sense, if not, you can always email one of us or right. we could definitely do the research and get back to you. There's still a bit of time. So yeah. um, there was a question. I'm trying to do this in order. Um, well, Tony asked another question. Okay. About um, the 20, I believe it was the one what you said, uh, Linda, was about the rent control. I forgot the number. But 21. Thank 21. You. Thank you. For units in multiple properties where long-term tenants pay lower rents, and newer tenants pay market value, when those long-term tenants move, can the rents be raised to what the newer tenants pay for like units in the same building? If not, low rent long-term uh, tenants will probably start getting rental increases on a regular basis to catch up. Well, so, so the rent control initiative currently there's, there is rent control under the Costa Hawkins Rental Housing Act um, that it's a state law and it limits how much the cities can uh, limit the rent increases. It doesn't, um, it, it does allow landlords to in increase the cost of rents for new tenants. However, if there's rent control on the property currently, they can't raise the rents of tenants who haven't moved out. So, uh, if the, so that's why there can be a huge disparity within the units as to what a particular tenant pays and what a new tenant might pay. Uh, the, the Proposition 21 would allow cities and counties to put some limits on how much the landlord can increase the rental costs for new tenants. It doesn't necessarily affect uh, anything with old, older tenants or existing tenants. It's just talking about limiting the amount that they can increase for new tenants. And it's up to 15% for within the first three years, 5% per year. Did that answer your question? Um, 
I, I don't see any more responses, but I did uh, try to answer Tony and tell him that if he has more questions, we will connect with him. Okay. Okay, let's see. Um, we have another one. Um, last year I moved, my mom went to the DMV to change the address on our license and ID. We registered to vote at the same time. So when our ballots came in the mail, I noticed that the envelopes are different from each other. Does that mean that these ballots are fake? Can you please email? Oh, okay, so she wants an email of this. So, I'm sorry, I read that last. So I'll take note that Galaxy J2 wants a email answer to this. Um, email, okay, let me take a snapshot of this. And let's see. So I was reading her Q and A. Can you so read it on your end? Yeah. Yeah. So you both registered to vote, um, and you got two separate ballots, which would be appropriate. You would each get a ballot, one for each of you, because you would both vote independently. Each of you have your own personal ballot. I so imagine um, the envelopes look different is what how I understood it. Oh, I see. The envelopes look different from each other. Oh, okay. The that, concern. That was how I understood too, that they didn't look the same. And he was under, uh, questioning the, the veracity of, of Okay, I'm sorry. Or the, genuine, the genuineness of it. Okay, but we'll, we'll answer him uh, via email. And then we have another one from Chris, Prop 22. I've heard there is a provision that prevents consumers from suing the gig company, e.g. Uber. For example, if the driver assaults a passenger, only the driver can be sued and Uber or Lyft is held harmless. Is this true? Also, I understand that if there is a problem with this law that we discover as it is implemented, it takes a seven out of eight vote to amend it. Is that true or is this unlikely? Hmm, that's gonna could take some research. So the first one was um, if, a, if, if this law passes, I'm just gonna rephrase it. If this law passes, then uh, a, a uh, person who is using the ride share cannot sue, like say Uber, they could only sue the individual driver. So is that, that's the question? That's true. Mm -hmm. That I need to, I would need to check into that. And then the other uh, statement was that it would take seven of eight um, Vote to amend it. votes to overturn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have not heard either of those um, in, in looking into these. Um, you know, uh, yeah, uh, 22, the cons against those who are against. I just talk about um, limiting workplace protections, flexibility. So let me look into that, uh, Patty, and then I will email you back. And if you can forward on to the person asking. Yes, I can definitely do that. We'll, we'll connect them to more resources, uh, more information about that. Hopefully we can find, dig a little bit deeper. Mm -hmm. All of this is dense. This legal ease is a bit dense, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Tony Wilkerson has um, an add-on, Prop 21. Okay. One long-term 20-year tenant pays $1,400. A newer tenant pays, let's say, $2,100 for a yes. like unit in the same building. How can a landlord put a unit on the market for less than the $2,100 without lowering all newer tenants to $1,400 by only raising 15% in three years? That's, that was the question. Oh, okay. Um, uh, the calculation of um, how that might happen. So what would happen is that um, you're correct that I haven't read anything that's, that explains which, 
I guess that which rent actually takes precedence when determining what's the starting point for the 15% increase. Um, because like you said, one, one uh, long-term renter is paying 14, one shorter term renter is paying 21. I haven't read anything in the uh, literature so far that says they start with the $2,100 renter and move the 15% increase from that point, or if they, or how, or how they're actually going to implement that. So I can, I can check and see if I can find something about how, how will they actually implement that, which rent would they use as their um, starting point for making that determination? Okay, thank you. I think that's all of it. We have quite a few kudos, kudos from oh, thank Joanna. You. Thank you so much for providing this very helpful forum. Joanna says that when the video is available, everybody, we're gonna have the whole video available. She's gonna share it on social media. We have many thanks from Jane. Jacqueline said, it's so great that the LWB is doing this. And then uh, we even had someone who said they needed this video. It's like NASCAR, super fast. So <laughs> they really enjoyed this format. So I wanted to thank everybody who came and especially our hosts today who offered this very important and informative presentation, the League of Women Voters of the Eden area. We really do appreciate all the work and time and energy that you put into this. We really, really appreciate your expertise, okay? For everybody, um, we will be uh, mailing out all of the participants, even the ones who couldn't make it. It is the League of Women Voters, um, it's the document that we will have. It's about 14 pages. League of Women Voters of California Education Fund. It's basically the overview that both Helen and Linda have based this presentation on, okay? So you'll, you can have your hard copy. Uh, you can have the, uh, it's, to be green, you can have the actual virtual copy, or you can come to our library and we will have some available, along with voter registration forms and other uh, documents, like the Easy Voter Guide, okay? Thank you so much, everybody. Take care and get out and vote. Tell all of your uh, families and, and all of your friends and neighbors. Yeah, exercise your right, okay? Thank you so much. Thank Have you. a good night. Thank Be you for safe. having us. Thank You're you. Welcome.